On today's show, we discuss whether the whistles have favored the Warriors and if LeBron is leaving the Cavs regardless of the outcome. We'll ask Trey in Cleveland if Iggy will return and rotation changes that could make a difference. And in Crossfire, we debate whether the Rockets should give Chris Paul a max contract. It's Wednesday, June 6th. The starter starts now. to the starters presented by Jack Daniels Tennessee Honey. Whether you're joining us live right now on NBA TV, watching later on YouTube, maybe listening to the podcast, doesn't matter. We're very happy to have you. I'm Jay Skeets and alongside me, as always, that's Tass Mellis. Hey, it's game day. To his right, the international man of mystery, taking it to the max, Lee Ellis. Friend. Lele. Mm, Lele, all right. On tonight's show, we will talk to Trey Kirby, the bearded one, live from Cleveland. And a little later on, Tass and Lee will step into the crossfire. They're going to debate whether or not the Rockets should offer the max to Chris Paul. But first, it is game night. We got game three of the NBA Finals. It's on ABC. It's at 9 p.m. Eastern. Very excited for this one. Now look, we'll get into what to watch for specifically in this game with TK live from Cleveland a little bit later. But I want to take a step back and ask you guys some big picture, sort of big series questions and even onward about this matchup between the Warriors and Cavs. So my first one, and these are all true or false, play along on Twitter, hashtag the starters. First one, guys, true or false, and people have been saying this, the refereeing has favored the Warriors in the finals. True or false? It's false. I mean, many people have been up in arms, not just fans, but also media members. Okay. Media members. And, and to me, you, if you're a respected media member, you can't just throw out a blanket statement like that without having the video evidence. So we're here to disprove that a okay. little bit because there have been calls that have gone both ways, that have been wrong calls, but there have also been calls made against the Cavs that people were up in arms about that were the right calls. Okay. And it all started midway through the fourth quarter of game one. This is a call on LeBron. It shouldn't have been on LeBron, but it should have been on Larry Nance here as he gets Kevin Durant. So it's fine that they blew a whistle. And then everything just snowballed from there going into overtime and such. This one, the second quarter of uh, game two, everyone was in a tizzy because they saw Clay Thompson get a call on the other end with him going sort of horizontal into the defender. But JaVale McGee was on the ground. That's the right call, a very, very good call, very tough call. And this call went against Jordan Bell. Yes, the Golden State Warrior instead of LeBron James. I think this was actually a makeup call. Four calls that had been going against the Cavs, but that should not have been against Jordan Bell whatsoever. So there have been some bad calls. That's, that's entirely true on both sides. Okay. On both sides. Do you agree you, with this? Yeah, you don't have to have an even foul call for both teams at the end of every game. In fact, you probably shouldn't have that because calls should be fouls should be called as they happen and it shouldn't ever be a case of well we called 10 on this team so let's call a few more for that team that's the wrong way to do it sometimes you're going to have a big discrepancy and other times a, le a lesser discrepancy but the referees should never be in a situation where they are making makeup calls because that doesn't help anybody so if one team is being more aggressive and they're getting foul calls that's fine you shouldn't just go down the other end and say how many fouls have we called on that team well let's let's make a few for the other team to make it even. It shouldn't be like that. Well, yeah, first off, you're right. I agree. I mean, you look at the total number of personal fouls in this series so far through two games and the free throw attempts and the free throw rate even there, it's in favor for the Cavs. I mean, the, the Warriors have gotten more fouls and shot less free throws, so that's there. The reason why we're talking about this and why this is a storyline, and quite frankly, unfortunately, it's sort of been a storyline the officiating all season long, but that's a whole other topic, is that the reversal call, back to game one, yeah. the block charge that may have determined whether or not the uh, Cavs couldn't pull that out, that game one out, right? This I, is why I, I we're doing this. Yeah. yeah, and the fact that it was actually reviewed in the first place, because the spirit of the rule is right. we're just looking at the, f the feet you know, behind the restricted area. But I believe Tony Brothers and Ken Maurer said, you know, we don't know what the call is. I call a block, you're calling a charge. So let's just use that restricted area call to be able to make the judgment call and rejudge it. And the fact that we're still here days later and we don't know, people are still disputing whether or not that was a block or a charge. Right. After watching it, li literally for days, in slow-mo, and people can't come to a consensus, I mean, that shows you how hard it is. Sure. And I know we say it all the time, but we literally, we're literally, literally looking at that play and we still can't decide, which yeah. I think is but crazy. But you ultimately but thought they got that one right. I think it's when I they think went it is and the right looked call. at it. And you didn't the right think call. that LeBron was totally there. They definitely made the right call. That was a block on LeBron, but it was how they got to that, which was what frustrated a lot of people because their initial 
uh, explanation was we had to check to see if his feet were in the restricted area. He was a mile out of the restricted area. Three officials should have been watching. That's where the play was and said, well, no, he definitely wasn't in the restricted area. So the original call should have stood. But it didn't. They overturned it. And then the Warriors went on to win yeah, the game. Yeah. That's the problem. That's why everyone's upset because the Cavs had a real chance to steal game one. They may not have still. There's yeah. no guarantee they, they go back on to steal that game or win that game. But I think that's where people feel like the referees are favouring the Warriors because when it was a bang-bang call, it went it back went. to Golden yeah. State. Yeah. Kevin Durant goes to the line, hits the free throws, and then the Warriors go on to win. But the referees ultimately got the call right. It was just the procedure and the process of getting to that call which has upset everybody. And I know people are out there going crazy saying, hey, there was a bunch of other calls which went against the Cavs. And they're, that's true. I mean, so let's be fair. There wrong calls, what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, let's be fair show and me show the NBA all the game, calls. though, that hasn't had a wrong call at some point. Yeah, that's true. It happens. It, it just snowballed and it went into that block mm. charge call. And, and this one wasn't called midway through the fourth quarter yeah. of game one. And again, it snowballed into the block charge. This is the first points for the Golden State Warriors as Kevin Durant went to the free throw line in overtime. Yeah. You know, when, when they yep. started that run in game one, and this is a clean, clean block. Okay, or strip, if you've I watched say, any NBA Hill. game before, you're right. You're going to see stuff like this. And, and that's the thing. We, we should really note that probably 75 to 80% of calls are right. And then, the, the NBA officials say they even it's higher than that. Right. It's like 92%. Sorry. Right. And this was a crazy call, I, I do believe. They thought it was a foul, so they're basically giving the ball back to Steph Curry. Which was the wrong call. Uh, I, I, I don't see a foul, though, on this play. This well, is, no, on. wait, that's he a gets foul. Hammered. That's but, a but foul. But how is that a foul? They're contesting you, for the ball, you, right? Look, they're contesting for the but ball. But he takes his legs out then, from under him. No, he doesn't. He just fumbles. He stumbles there. No, that, no, that's absolutely wrong. No. The NBA has come out and said that call was wrong. Well, I disagree. Because and they're, I wrong. Believe, they're right. I believe if you're contesting for the ball like that, as they were, and then LeBron landed, and then he just lost his balance and went out of court. I, I, look, again, I think that was a wrong call. Do I think that was the ultimate deciding factor yeah. in the Warriors crushing them in game two? Not at all. Yeah. Think, Not think, at all. I think this call actually proves how difficult it is to officiate LeBron James because he's so strong, he stays yeah. on his feet. And yeah. that's yeah. why, that. when I watched it at first, I thought he stayed on his feet and then just sort of stumbled afterwards. But it is the initial bump yeah. that but Steph see, gets him, I, I and then he, he can't keep his I balance. think in that instance, he gathered himself, but then he just lost his balance because he was up in the air and he was running towards where the ball was going to go. And the, go and the body's hit doesn't necessarily mean there was interference by either of those players that affected his catch. I like All that right. you bring up LeBron, though. I think that is an interesting part, and I think that's why this is a narrative here. A lot of people are cheering. Correct me if I'm wrong. They're cheering for the Cavs and LeBron to put up a fight here to maybe even beat the Mighty Warriors. And some people are upset like, or they're surprised, like, LeBron's a superstar. He doesn't seem to be getting that superstar call. Mm. And it goes back a little bit to, like, he's tough to officiate. He is sort of that new version of Shaq where it's like, he creates a lot of the contact. Do we call a foul over single play? I think that's what's sort of all wrapped up here that people are like, oh, LeBron should be getting the benefit of the, wh the whistle here to make yeah. this maybe a, a closer series. Yeah, well, people can't. Uh, they're, they're watching it now with wine and gold colored glasses because <laughs> ever af after that, the block charge call, it's sort of it's snowballed and that's it. I mean, every call is against the Cavs now. All right, well, next one here, another true or false for you guys. This one has to do with LeBron. True or false, LeBron is leaving the Cavs regardless of the outcome of this series. Warriors sweep, Warriors in five, even the Cavs come back to win in seven. Is that true or false that he leaves false. regardless? It's false that he's leaving regardless. I think. What would it take for him to stay? Well, I think oh, it's so actually... Win? I, I don't think they necessarily have to win the championship for him to stay, but I think he needs to sit down with the uh, management and the ownership afterwards and see what the direction is of this team because one of the conditions of him returning to Cleveland in the first place was the owner, Dan Gilbert, to go out and spend money, and he's done that. He did that. And I believe he will continue to do that if that's what it takes to keep LeBron there. But LeBron probably looks at this team and says, look, we sh shook it up halfway through the season. Things got in better, better a little bit at the time, but they do need some more superstar talent. So if Kobe Altman and the ownership has a plan in mind saying, we're going to target this player and this player and, and figure out a way to get it done, then I think LeBron is more likely to return, but he's going to wait to see those things happen before he decides where he's playing next season. But he's leaving because he looks at this team and... <sighs> They can't win in the foreseeable future. He can't see that. Well, they not spent this money. Team. Yeah. Yeah. So how how can they turn it over? He also knows he's human. He's 33. Going next year, he's 34. How can they turn the, the team over that quickly to compete with the Warriors or the Rockets? They can't. And he's already won in Cleveland. I, I don't think he needs to stay there to continue this legacy for years on end. Right. I, I think he knows that I got to go somewhere else if I'm going to get a championship. And his best years are this year, next year maybe, the year after that. They're not winning in Cleveland, I don't think. You're right, they spent money, but not on the right guys. It hasn't, right. It hasn't worked. Right. I, 
I, I just think back to 2014 when we were in Vegas when we found out LeBron was going back to Cleveland yeah. and how much of a shock that was, and we were like, what's going on? And I remember, I think I said it on the air at the time, I said, he's going back to Cleveland, he's never going to leave there again. He won't go through what he did the first time, taken by talents to South Beach and all that. Right. He'll be in Cleveland for the rest of his career. I don't believe that at all anymore because he did come back, he wanted to bring a chip to Akron, to Cleveland, to Ohio. He did that, and now people are like, Go get some more. You're mm. probably not going to get it with the Cavs. I don't think people would be all that upset if he went to a Philly in L.A., a Houston, wherever it may be. Yeah, see, Houston I don't think works, though, if they want to keep Chris Paul as well. No, yeah, no. Like, so they, that, that's the I other mean, thing. if anyone could do it, Daryl Morey yeah. could maybe make it happen, but you're These right. These other options, like going to L.A., the Lakers are on the up, but they're not ready to compete right now for a championship. Philadelphia, that's an interesting little mix there as well. Let's hear from you guys. True or false to both of those big questions, the officiating, LeBron possibly leaving. When we come back, we'll get into Game 3 with the bearded one, TK, right there. <laughs> Live from the finals in Cleveland, don't go anywhere. The Starters is brought to you by Jack Daniels Tennessee Honey, official partner of the NBA. Yeah, rock and roll is not dead. Joining us live from Cleveland, it's the bearded one, Trey Kirby. Ayo! Yeah! Ayo! <laughs> We're off to a great start. We can hear you, and the camera isn't moving around. This is going to be great. All right, TK, <laughs> before we get into game three of the finals, uh, did you get up to anything fun today? Well, we can all agree that LeBron has needed some help here in the finals. So I went out to the Fan Fest and put together my combine package, I think you would say. Got my measurables together, starting off clearly NBA size, 6'5 in bare feet, 6'6 in shoes, but nearly 6'9 with the curls, feeling like Fletch out there. My hands, they compare favorably. I would say to J.R. Smith, you know, I got I got a small hand. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It's mostly <laughs> palm, but I can still get my hand around the ball. My feet, of course, would be the smallest on the cab, so we can not spend too much time talking about that. But the key here is the athleticism. You got to be able to switch. Whoa and guard the rim if you're playing out on the wing against the Warriors. And look at those ups, guys. I'm out jumping Kevin Love on a <laughs> billboard there, looking like a middle hitter, as my friend Mo Verney would say. Oh, we almost got some brownies there with that jump, too. Actually, they didn't peep out. All right, so you might play for the Cavs tonight. That's good news for LeBron and them and trying to get back into the series. But let's get into game three with a little what to watch. I got a few cues for Trey there in Cleveland and the guys here in the studio in Atlanta. The first question, I mean, after game two, Coach Lou started talking about the idea of, like, we might give Rodney Hood an opportunity. So I'm going to ask you guys, will the Cavs' rotation changes, if we do see him in Game 3, make a difference at all? TK, what do you think? Well, like you said, Rodney Hood is getting a chance, and the people have been clamoring for some Rodney Hood. I think it might be a little bit of a confidence thing waiting to play him in Game 3. He's playing here at home where the Cavs have been good, and maybe that's just a little friendlier place for Rodney Hood to make his first real appearance in this city or in this series. Uh, he's kind of a trick-or-treat player, just like Jeff Green, just like George Hill. We will know early if Rodney Hood is going to be producing for the Cavs. If he comes out, hits a three-pointer, maybe hits a pull-up jumper, things will be looking good. We will know right away, I think, if Rodney Hood's making an impact as soon as he steps on the floor. I'm not so concerned with the impact Rodney Hood is going to make because I don't think it's really going to be the barometer if they're going to win or not. They need a bit of a defensive identity, the Cavs do. They can't just allow 120-plus like they have in Games 1 and Games yep. 2. they got to slow somebody down. They might be able to outshoot them one game, but if you're legitimately going to win, you have to slow some guys down. So you mentioned one of those trick-or-treat players. That's who I'm looking for, Jeff Green. Get a little – I mean, he is the guy that can do it on both ends. Rodney Hood, he can do it on one end. Uh, and I, I'm not really looking forward to what he provides on the defensive end. Jeff Green, I know he is definitely uh, on the El Tizo team, as we used to call him. Very tricky, very treaty. You never know what you're going to get from him. But he can switch out on the perimeter. He can guard. Will he uh, contribute offensively? That's another question. What do you I, think? Yeah, I, I would go with Rodney Hood. I think Jordan Clarkson has, has, has burnt his opportunity, and now it's a chance for Rodney Hood. You know, it hasn't been a great playoffs for him. Now he gets a chance to go out there and maybe have an impact on this team and on this series. So I think if you tie Lou, why not? And if it doesn't work, you yank him early, and then you maybe have to go back to Jordan Clarkson. But I would certainly at least start by giving those minutes to Rodney Hood. All right, well, let's switch it over to the Warriors side of things. And, and Trey, again, I'll start with you. Do we know whether or not Andre Iguodala is finally going to play in this series? I mean, is he still questionable? Is it a game-time decision? What do you know, again, from being there in Cleveland? 
I wouldn't lock it in, as we like to say, but I would say all signs point towards yes. Yesterday, Steve Kerr officially upgraded him to questionable, mentioned that he practiced, played some one-on-one -on -one today. He said that Iggy's going to basically be a game-time decision. He's going to warm up pregame and see how things go. He said that Iguodala is leaning in the right direction, so I would imagine we're going to see him on the court sooner rather than later, and if that's the case, things get even harder for the Cavs. That's another playmaker, the best possible LeBron defender they had, and I imagine that Iguodala is going to want to play as much as he can in the finals just to make sure that ring's pretty uh, legitimate, you know? Yeah, do you guys think, though, if Iguodala does play in Game 3 or even Game 4, that Kerr goes back to starting him like he did there? You got the, the death lineup, the Hamptons five, or does he stick with what's working, either going with a big and McGee or even back to Looney? What would you do if you were Kerr in that I think you could always just going to ease him in, yeah. bring him off the bench, and then finish the game with the death lineup if it's going well because that is definitely their best lineup. But the, he also doesn't like starting him all the time because it sort of mm. burns that lineup with Draymond Green at center. Yep. It, it, it's tough for Draymond to do that many minutes at the center spot, so that's what I see happening. He had success with JaVale starting in game two, so I don't see why Steve Kerr would now change that because JaVale hit six for six from the floor and defended well. And again, Iggy's coming off an injury, so you probably want the game to start first so he can get into it after, there's, uh, you know, after the sort of first initial burst of the game has started. But I expect to see Andre play without a minute's restriction once he does get on the floor, though. Yeah, it's two and a half weeks since he's played. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, especially for an injury at the time didn't seem like look no. all that bad. But, you no. know, obviously was a bone bruise there and, and, and leg contusion, as they called it. All right, Trey, well, before we let you go, got to give you your finals challenge. Now, Lee had some success in game two. We said go get a selfie with a celebrity. He got chameleon air. He was riding <laughs> dirty. Uh, not bad, you know, success, he did Colin. it. But I'm tired of the selfie celebrities. So, Trey, we're, we're kicking it up a notch. Your finals challenge for game three is to not only find a celebrity and not, not take a selfie with them, but to, to get a video of them endorsing the starters. All right, I was a little worried that I was going to have to find Cabillionaire, so this is maybe a little bit easier. I don't know if you guys are going to accept other former NBA players as celebrities, but if so, I'm going to go try and talk to Vince Carter as soon as we're done talking here. Uh, okay, Vince well, Carter, he wins. Yeah, Vince, yeah, yeah, but try and avoid the NBA players if you can. Try and go for a celebrity Get outside Doris. of the NBA world. I saw yeah. Doris in the all background. Right, I'm looking Get for Doris. Crazy Bone, Lazy Bone, and all the other busy bones out there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Sadly, he says hi. Okay. Is Guy Fieri make the trip? Do we know if he's there? Maybe find him. All right. Great stuff, TK. Enjoy the game tonight. When we come back, Tass and Lee step into the crossfire to debate whether the Rockets should give Chris Paul the max. Or crossroads. Crossfire! <laughs> Welcome to Crossfire, presented by TSO. Here's how this works. The champ. We'll take on the challenger in three rounds head-to-head. -head. At the end of it all, I'll declare the winner. And as always, the belt is on the line. All right, first one, guys. Round one. Here we go. According to Woj, the Rockets will reportedly need to offer Chris Paul a max contract to keep him in free agency this summer. Be a lot of money for a 33-year-old. Had some injuries. So, guys, I want to know, would signing Chris Paul to a max be a good decision for the Houston Rockets? Here we go. At 33 years old, pay him till he's 38, uh-uh. More importantly, you want to build a winner, take a discount. The Miami Heat, the San Antonio Spurs, the team he just lost to, the Golden State Warriors. Many people think that, oh, they just bought their team. Well, they bought it because Steph Curry took an incredible discount. They later signed Andre Iguodala because of it. They later signed Kevin Durant because of it. You want to build a winner, take a discount, CP3. Ooh. Yeah, I think it's either the Max or he's going to sign somewhere else. But if you're the Rockets, you're one popped Chris Paul hamstring away from making the NBA Finals this year. You've come this far, you may as well go all in. I understand he's a little bit older, I understand he's had a few injuries, but worry about that down the line. Right now, this is when your win now opportunity window is open. You've got to go for it. Go for the max, keep Chris Paul, run this thing back, and you might find yourself in the NBA Finals, not just yet, next year, year after as well. Maybe they can get some good insurance on him because he has that endorsement with State Farm. Oh, uh, that's possible, that's possible. All right, good round. Round two here, guys. Sticking with the summer look ahead. After LeBron, we all know current OKC forward Paul George is the most sought after, after name excuse me, on the market. So I want to know, what do you think would be the best destination for PG-13? Here we go. There's only one destination for Paul George, and that's the only team he wants to play for. It's the Lakers. Why complicate this? If you're another team out there, you look at Paul George and go, we know he wants to play for the Lakers. They've got a good young team. They're on the way up. Paul George is still not, like, in his 30s. He's still got a plenty of time to win this championship as the Lakers grow. 
I just don't think any other team should waste their time unless maybe the Thunder, maybe you can convince him to come back and give it another try. Otherwise, he's going to the Lakers. All right, all right, all right. I think the Sixers are perfect. He wants to win now. The Lakers are way far down the road. He can take the big shots with the Sixers until Ben Simmons gets a jump shot. If that ever happens, who knows? And this is a team that plays defense. So he won't have to take the biggest assignment each and every night. I think it's perfect for him. You slide into the number there. one role. That he is doesn't want to. He wants to go home. He wants to go home with his family and chill and on lose. Whoa, 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 and whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> We're all tied up. We're all tied up after two. Final round here. Everyone's favorite giant, Boban Marjanovic, has been cast as an assassin <laughs> in the upcoming <laughs> film John Wick, Chapter Three. We already know Boban's going to be a star. So I want to know what's the next movie franchise that you could see Boban killing it in? Here we go. White Chicks. What? The what? Ringer did a great table read with Boban where he read the lines. Mm. So just pretend that I'm 7'3 and reading these, okay? You want to talk about mothers? You want to talk about mothers? <laughs> it's mother time. Your mother is so dumb she went to Dr. Dre for a pap smear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Boban can deliver the He's funny. He's got the comedy chops. You're right. White Chicks. Uh, all right, what do you got? The only thing missing from the Austin Powers franchise oh, man. is Boban. <laughs> Because he can play both the dueling character, the Dr. Evil side and the good side. And I think, look, this is what is missing, the Bob member. Wouldn't he be perfect the Bob, out there? The Bob I just think member. this is fantastic. This is what we need, Austin Powers, because after Gold Member, it's been a little bit, uh, it, he's been running out of ideas. Mike Myers, Boban in LA, it's perfect. Wow, wow, great crossfire battle. I can't win that, I was about I? to give it to the white <laughs> chick or white man, but I'm going with a new champion, <laughs> the Austin Powers. Uh, Bob Lee Member. <laughs> he's the greatest. <laughs> Lee Ellis wins. Yeah. What a comeback there in the round three. I thought White Chicks was going to get it done, Taz. All right, when we come back, our game three predictions. Don't go anywhere. The film room has always been a tool used to measure and fine-tune a player's craft. He stepped up and took over. He said, here's what I can do and then went out and did it. NBA Finals Film Room, presented by YouTube TV, tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern on NBA TV. All right, tonight on NBA TV, this is the place to be. Pre-game coverage coming up next. You got the game on ABC. Come on back to NBA TV for post-game live. Quick game three predictions. Let's hear it. Who you got winning? Cavs, hopefully. Cavs, hopefully. Yeah, I think I'm going dubs. You're going Warriors? Yeah. Close one? Yeah, okay. it's going to be a fight, but I'll go with the better. Who you got? I'm going Warriors in five. Close game. I think Durant takes the lead back in the finals MVP, though. There All you right. go. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Thanks for joining us, folks. And remember, tomorrow you'll be seeing Chase, Oliver, and Sebastian instead of us. <laughs> oh, I'd watch that. Race the night, people.